things before I get into the message of the morning. One of them probably needs no explanation to most people because of the song we sung, but you'll notice in the song that we just sang that uh, he's the song, if you don't know the scripture, it says, uh, Behold thy mother. And uh, it sounds like, uh, or Behold thy son, it sounds like that it's uh, Jesus saying, Behold me. But the scripture is saying, Behold John. And from that day forward, John took her into his house. So we need to keep that in mind. The other thing is, the lectureship has been noted is coming up. I hope all will come and invite people to be with you. It's not like we haven't known when it was going to be because it's been on this weekend for I don't know how many years. So we should know in making our plans that we know in view of Matthew 6.33 how those plans ought to be made. So I hope that you'll be here, be praying for it, be supportive of it. This morning I want us to consider... Not because you are ignorant of the Bible's teaching on it, but because it's so easy to read and forget that we have a terrible adversary who seeks our destruction. In closing his first letter, the general epistle of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 5, he points out in verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And then we have the admonition in the next verse, whom resist steadfast. How do you do that? In the faith. Well, in Jude 3, Jude was saying, contend for the faith. And we know that the faith there is the New Testament system and all component parts thereof. So whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. The point I want to make is, is that there's not a second of every minute of every hour of every day that Satan is not interested in getting you into hell. That's what he exists. He's a real person. He's not human. He's a supernatural person. He is the epitome and the origin of all evil, of all falsehood. Whatever God wants, he is against. If God wants you to be saved from your sins and be in heaven with him, he doesn't. Paul, even in writing to the Corinthians, says we're not ignorant of Satan's devices, but I must say, I don't know if that's the case, everybody how he works through seemingly rather innocent things to draw our attention away from the most important thing. And what is that? Being faithful to God so heaven will be our home. He will use anything in this world to get you to neglect serving God. Now, you'll notice as we keep in mind that he's a roaring lion or as a roaring lion going about seeking whom may devour. And by the way, that idea in the Greek is gobble you up. You want to have a passage that goes over well with the little ones, then gobble you up seems to do it. But as children of God, we especially ought to know that. This is written to members of the church. And Satan's going about seeking to gobble us up. That's all he does. You think about in your day how you do various things. He does one thing. He goes about gobbling up people. He does not do it without their cooperation. You remember that. He does not do it except on the basis of the decisions they make and the actions in which they engage. It works the same way when it comes to our being saved from our sins. God wants us to be saved. The evidence, if nothing else, just in the Lord's Supper and the 
emblems of the supper tells us how much God wants us to be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But he can't save anybody without their cooperation. He is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Now let's look here for a moment to Matthew. And I looked at Matthew 16. And I want to look here because it was Peter who wrote those words we just read as part of the New Testament. Inspired of the Holy Spirit to write it, it's infallible, it's the truth. But when we look to Matthew 16, we're going to look at Peter again. Peter with the Lord. And we see in verse 13, when Jesus came to the coast, that is the borders, of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Well, as I've said so many times, you start asking people, about religion or about God or about most anything, really. You get all kinds of answers. So some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, some one of the prophets. Then he says, but, but who, who do you say that I am? And Peter, Simon Peter, answered a great answer, a marvelous answer. And said, Thou art the Christ. That means the anointed one. In Jewish mind, that was highly significant. The designated person. The son of the living God. Jesus then answers him and says, Blessed art thou, Simon, bar Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now, I'm not going through with the rest of it right here because that's not the point I want to make. The point is, is that here is a man so honest and good and answers so well and a marvelous statement. And then when you go down through all of this, you come to verse 21. And verse 21 reads, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must now we know the meaning of the word must. Can't get around it. It has to be this way. There's no setting it aside. He must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now watch this same Peter just a few verses earlier that had received a blessing from the Lord for the marvelous confession. Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. Have you ever been in a situation to where you really were having to muster the strength to do it because it had to be done? But you wish it didn't. You wish there was another way around. Now go a little ahead and think about what we saw before us on the screen and read about Jesus' attitude in the garden as he prayed to his father. And you see what a strain, and that's putting it lightly, there was upon the man Jesus. But it came to having to go to the terrible ordeal and shame of the cross. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He knows he has to do it. He knows it's the right thing to do. But it's, but it's an ordeal, and you don't like ordeals. You don't like pain and anguish. And pain and anguish doesn't do justice to what happens when you're nailed to a cross. And you know when you're in that strait and somebody comes up and says, wait a minute, maybe you don't have to do that. In fact, you don't have to do that. Oh, no, that can't happen to you. What does it do to you? 
Does it encourage you to go ahead and do what you know you must do? Certainly not. It discourages you. And you see the response of Christ who always did what his father wanted him to do. Notice that he turns. Evidently, Peter is walking behind him. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. Why? Why was Peter by that statement of an offense unto Jesus? Because it was thwarting him from doing what had to be done to even save Peter from his sins. It didn't encourage him to bear up. Remember in the garden, Jesus goes away from the apostles and he earnestly prays the words we've all read. And what do the apostles do? You see, we're not too unlike them. They go to sleep. And he comes back to them and says, couldn't you pray with me just for a while? Where's the encouragement? To do what must be done for your own sakes. Where's the encouragement? Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Peter was seeing things the way men would. He wasn't seeing eternity. He wasn't seeing the judgment of all men. He wasn't seeing the only way to save man from his sins. He was seeing a death. This morning in class, Jeff did such a good job in pointing out about the matter of when God says something, if you know he said it, then just do it whether you know the outcome of it or not. That's what faith is, taking God at his word, trusting him. But Peter is looking on one level, seeing only one thing. You see this in Peter when it comes to the washing of the disciples' feet, where the Lord was trying to say, he that would be greatest among you, let him be your servant. And when they washed feet in those days, folks, they were grimy, gritty, smelly, nasty feet. And it was a refreshing thing when people came to their house, houses since they walked most everywhere they did for the servants to wash their feet. Well, that was so beneath the Lord washing the disciples' feet. Peter said, they're going to wash me. And the Lord had to hit him again. If I don't wash your feet, you don't have a part in a lot with me. And then Peter runs the other direction. Well, Lord, not my feet only, but my whole body. Well, he just simply said, we'll wash what's dirty and leave the rest alone. Peter is so much like us. And here he's a tool of Satan. And Christ just calls him Satan. How would you like for your Lord, because of something you said to him, turn around and say to you, get thee behind me, Satan. Now what did we learn that Peter himself wrote by Holy Spirit inspiration? The devil is as a roaring lion, goeth about seeking him, he may devour. Peter doesn't know it. This is one of those cases where you, can, you know Peter's sincere. He means well. Oh, how many sincere, well meaning people have made a mess of very important matters. Their emotions take over, and their sensibility of rational powers is thrown out the window. Or their attachment to affairs of this present world dominate how they view anything. Now think with me for a moment in view of what we've seen here and what the devil does all the time. And what we see in Peter, how one moment being so great and getting a blessing for the Lord, not but just a little later, being called Satan. Because he was thwarting the Savior's work to save us from our sins. When you look around about us, there are those who do not believe in God. They are atheists. They say God does not exist. In fact, nothing spiritual exists. And that appeals to some people. You say, well, it doesn't appeal to me. But being an atheist and a materialist appeals to a lot of people. For some reason, they enjoy saying, well, this is the way it is now. And uh, 
When I'm dead, that's the end of it because all there is is matter and that's all that matters. And when you're dead, you go out of existence and that's the end of it. Well, that appeals to people. That's one lure in Satan's tackle box and he's got a bunch of people in that position. But maybe that doesn't appeal to you. Do you think then, okay, Satan's going to leave me alone? Then there are those who will say God exists, but they don't believe Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God. That doesn't suit people, all people, but it suits some people. The Jews and Muslims and many others are that way, although the Muslim concept of God is not the God of the Bible. He is a false God. I know they said, well, we serve the same God. But when you read their material and see how Allah is, he, he's not Jehovah God Almighty. They have connections back down the line as far as their ethnic background is concerned. They don't believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God, and neither do the Jews, neither do the Hindus, and so on. Well, that appeals to people. It doesn't mean maybe to you or to the atheist, but it appeals to some people. So Satan's got that lure out there floating in the water. And a lot of people have already hung up on it, and others will. But then maybe somebody says, I believe in God, and I believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the Savior of the world. But I don't really believe this Bible is necessary for me to be acceptable and pleasing to that God. <clears throat> Atheism doesn't bother that fella. He wouldn't accept it. Same thing with Jesus Christ. Now there's various ways we reject the Bible. We may not know how to write and divide it, 2 Timothy 2.15, which we must if we're to understand the way to heaven. We may not know how it authorizes and how we ascertain that authority, but we must if heaven is to be our home, Colossians 3.17. So there are people who say, yeah, the Bible is a very important book, a holy book, and they may even call it God's Word. But when they get through defining inspiration, they don't think it's in, the writers of it are any more inspired than was Milton or Shakespeare or Longfellow or some of those people because they don't accept plenary verbal inspiration, such as is described in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scriptures given by inspiration of God. That is theophanistos, that is breathed out from God. And we know then that it's the Father through the revelation of the Holy Spirit that we have the Son's will given in the New Testament. And all of God's Word gives us the complete story of the salvation of man. There are those who don't believe it that way. I was thinking this morning when Jeff referred to Isaiah in the auditorium class. And I forgot now exactly, Jeff, what you asked about, but I started to say, well, it's according to what redactor I am following is to. Well, a redactor is a fellow that says, well, I know what it was. Now, Cyrus, who was written about long before Cyrus, king of Persia, was on the scene. And so you've got to explain that some way, but you don't believe in the plenary verbal inspiration of the Bible. So how did the writer know? Well, he simply lived after Cyrus was there and did all these things. So he goes back and he writes that part in Isaiah. You see, he would still say he believes the Bible, but look what he does to it. So you've got atheism appealing to people, the lack of belief in Christ, the Son of God, the lack of belief in the Bible as a plenary verbal inspired word of God, the final rule of faith and practice. You come on down and, and here are people who believe in worshiping God, at least they say so. They believe in serving God, whatever their idea of service is. But they don't believe you can do anything in order to be saved. Oh, they may uphold every moral teaching there is in the Bible. They may be just as upset as you are about abortion and homosexuality. But they don't understand even the right division of the Bible and they're just as apt to be wandering around over Leviticus trying to get the answer to the question of what must I be, do to be saved by Jesus Christ. 
You won't find that in Leviticus. Now, if you study Leviticus like you ought to, it'll lead you, it'll direct you, it will guide you in the right division of the word to where you can find out, but it won't be in Leviticus or Genesis or Exodus or Numbers or Deuteronomy. Because God has located his power to save in the gospel, the glad tidings of Christ, Romans 1.16. But there are a lot of people out there believing in God and the Holy Spirit and the Son and the Bible and salvation, that there is sin, but they not, may not believe it's sin that you commit and each person commits by transgressing God's law. They may believe that, well, Adam committed it and it's been passed on down Adam's original sin, you know, to when you're born in this world, you're guilty of it. And that's got to think of the lures Satan has out there as he all day long fishes for you. And so then you got those folks saying you don't have to be baptized, be saved. And yet they'll look at the Bible and they'll read, Baptism doth also now save us, 1 Peter 3, 21. And they'll look back at you and say, no, not so. Let me tell you a little thing that happened long years ago. I had a daily radio program in Van Buren, Arkansas. And uh, the radio station was on the second floor of a building. And I was preaching a series of lessons, because it was daily, 11.30, 11.45, on uh, the Holy Spirit at that time. That's a very Pentecostal part, or at least it was, uh, of that area. So there's a lot of folks of that persuasion. So we were dealing with the Holy Spirit and his uh, work and the miracles and the cessation of miracles and the design and purpose of miracles and so forth. <laughs> well, as I came down one day, this fellow, a young man who was his a little younger than I was. In those days, I guess that was probably when I was past my mid-twenties. He's, I don't know how he recognized me, but he got my attention and came over and we visited. And then we got into a, a Bible study. And we met at the church building. And we got off of the miracles after a while because I wanted to get him on to what must I do to be saved. So what I did was simply this. We both agreed the Holy Spirit this reveal this word, that it is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We both believe that, don't we? Yes, we do. Well, let's see then, since we're so concerned about the Holy Spirit, what does the Holy Spirit actually say regarding salvation? So we begin a study. And in one of the studies, I turned over to Acts 22 and the, that account of Paul's conversion. We hadn't touched it. We hadn't spoken about it. It hadn't been intimated about. We had studied other things. And I just ha said, let me have your Bible. And I turned over to it, and I said, will you read, and I had him start up earlier, and read all the way down Acts 22, 16. He read down through there. And when he got to Ananias' question, and now why tarriest thou, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, he paused, looked up at me and said this, that's just your interpretation. I had said nothing. I handed to him the Bible that he admitted was produced by the Holy Spirit. That's what got us talking in the first place. And yet that lure of Satan that you don't have to be baptized to be saved from your sins by Jesus Christ was not only hung in the bony part of his mouth, it was a treble hook and the other part was down his throat and wasn't coming out. Later I found out in our last meeting, because I think it was that summer that we moved to Muskogee, Oklahoma, he hadn't told me this through our study, but the last meeting he said, you know, I've been taking the arguments that you've been making to me, and I've been trying them out on our Bible class, and they made me quit. Why? Why did not I tell him something's up? Because I don't know whether the young man ever obeyed the gospel or not. I seriously doubt it. But imagine when Satan has got such a hook in you that you can read straight from the Bible that you've already confessed to be a production of God and the book is for the salvation of man and you look at the other fellow and say that's just your interpretation. Does that tell you how deeply Satan can get his hooks into us? But now I mention atheism, the deity of Christ or the lack of it. 
And um, the Bible is the inspired word of God. I mentioned about salvation. We could talk about repentance in the same way. But what about those of us who have believed in God, believed in Christ? Those of us who have believed in the Bible is the word of God. Those of us who have heard the gospel, who believe it to be the power of God to salvation. Those of us who have obeyed each step in the plan of salvation and we were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Satan not going to just leave us alone, isn't he? I remind you, Peter wrote those words that we read in 1 Peter to Christians. Now let me ask you, is he leaving you alone? Truth of the matter is, he's not leaving me alone and he won't leave me alone until the day I die. And if you think he's leaving you alone, he's already got you snagged. He's not going to leave any of us alone. Think for a moment. He has everyone else. Who does he not have? Those who are in the body of Christ. The realm of the saved. That institution to which the Lord adds everyone who's baptized to Christ for the remission of sins. Now here's how he works it with us. I couldn't tell you how many times this has happened. And it demonstrates a bad attitude, a bad way of thinking. We studied about the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 earlier, the beautiful attitudes. When you see somebody who's a member of the church come up and say, Do I have to attend every worship Assembly of the church. Is that an indicator? It can indicate several things. But why would they even ask something like that? Do I have to study God's holy word every day? Do I have to pray every day? Here's a biggie. Do I have to give as I've been prospered cheerfully without grudging of what I have? There's all sorts of lures. You know, everything I've said here, we already knew. So watch our decisions. Our decisions will determine our eternal destiny. They may seem innocent. It may be that I choose this job or this recreation or these friends. Do you think Satan would use any one of those things to get you to be unfaithful to him? If not, why is there this statement? Be not deceived. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. And on and on we could go regarding matters that pertain to faithfulness in the church of our Lord. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that basically means as you're going as a child of God, what else would you do but preach the same thing that saved you? So therefore, wherever you are, Souls need to be saved, and you're looking for that opportunity to teach. Somebody rises up and declares before you, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. What do you do about it? Do you stand up for the Lord? Or do you try to start talking in a way or acting in a way that you don't want to get yourself in trouble so you don't address the matter? Did you, you know, we use this term, I'm here to tell you. Well, we are. If you're faithful to God and know what a Christian is, the church is here to tell you, you must be baptized as a penitent believer in order to be saved. And somebody says, you don't have to be, you say, I'm here to tell you otherwise. And I'll show you in the Bible you claim is God's word what he says. If any man speak, same Peter said, let him speak as the oracles of God. Years and years ago, it was said of the church when there was a backbone in it. Well, all you people, all you ever going to do is spute. Now, you probably haven't been around for a while and you don't know the old country uh, expression, 
of dispute. Well, that's why you shorten it. All you want to dispute with somebody all the time. And that's because our brethren were out here across the back fence or at the country store or wherever they were. And when the Baptist or the Methodist or whatever started speaking up contrary to what they knew the Bible taught because they studied it, then they spewed And they had that reputation. And thus the reputation went out that, you know, if you can't find a Bible in the courtroom, just bring a member of the church up there and put your head on it and swear to tell the truth the whole Truth and nothing but the truth, which is a novel idea these days anyway. <laughs> Brethren, the little things lead to big things. Every adult here one time was a little baby. Every one of you. And look where you are now. All your children are little and they're growing. What are you leading them into? Now, you may lead a life just like Paul's and be a godly man like he would have been if he had been a husband and a father, and they may still choose to go do what they want to do because Adam and Eve did. And they had God for their father. But the point is, we have to finally do what Joshua said, as was pointed out the other night by Mark, choose you this day whom ye will serve, but it's for me and my house will serve the Lord. And all that that means. So old Satan is with us right now even. He will do all he can to get your mind off what I said. He'll do all he can to say, well, that doesn't apply to me, or I've got to do this or this. He'll do it all. And he'll never stop. And once he gets you to move off of center, so to speak, letting center be the truth, then he's got you going, and he'll keep moving. And you'll go further and further away from the truth. Yes, get thee behind me, Satan, was said to a rather good man who inadvertently served Satan. Let's not be ignorant of Satan's devices. Let's be sure that in all things that we're obedient to him because he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5, 9. If you're not a child of God today in the process of this study, we study what one must do to become a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Remember the church Jesus built. And folks, there are no Christians Save people outside of the church of Christ as that term is defined and used in the New Testament. I don't care how many people from Abilene Christian University or any other university declare otherwise. No, it's not true. I don't care how many doctorates you have behind your name in theology from Harvard. It's not true. I know that because the Bible tells me what's right. And I don't need them. To be so educated, they lead me away from the Bible. If I, it's amazing to me. If, if I'm educated, should that help me understand God's Word? And if I'm true to education and all that really education means, should not help me accept the truth on any subject? And so, the plan of salvation is clear. Now, as a child of God, Satan having any influence with you? Oh, maybe you mean well, but you better check your well out. It may not fit the well of the Bible. It may be a poison well, and you're drinking from it. And you're giving other people water from it. And the pattern of life you're setting before other people is not helping the church. It's not helping your wife. It's not helping you. It's not helping your husband. It's not helping your children. It's saying the world is the most important thing. Well, I don't cuss, and I don't whatever. Fine. You can't go to heaven, Galatians 5. But just what are you doing to spread the gospel of Christ and defend the faith? What are you doing to make a difference in the spring church of Christ? That's where we are. Think about it. If you sin, you need to repent of those sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. Now the decision's yours. So please come to Christ if you need while we stand and sing.